yeah, to have you all here. Uh, yeah, our last in-person one was the last one of last year. Uh, so hopefully we can have more of these in person uh, throughout the year. Um, and yeah, for the first couple of months, we're going to do this hybrid staff where it's going to be, you know, in person, but also we have the Zoom audience. That's why there's a bunch of tech up in front over here. Uh, but yeah, um, so for those of you, uh, for some of the new faces, uh, the Bidal Talks are a, are a uh, weekly series of talks that happen uh, every Wednesday here at uh, Albert Hall at the School of Archaeology, where we bring speakers from various backgrounds to talk about the research interests and a diverse range of topics. So today, uh, we have uh, Dr. Michael Rivera from Hong Kong University to speak on his um, uh, research and uh, his uh, teaching in uh, teaching bioarchaeology uh, in Hong Kong. Um, so um, I don't think we have any announcements. So uh, actually, let me just bring up his bio notes. <laughs> oh, do we? Uh, that is an announcement, yes. Uh, yeah, I have a proposal on Friday. So if you are willing to suffer more of me talking on Friday, uh, please join so that I will at least have some friendly faces while I suffer on Friday. Okay, here we go. So Dr. Michael B. C. Rivera is a Filipino Chinese Hong Konger who, who teaches, researches, writes, and speaks for public audiences in the fields of bioarchaeology and biological anthropology. His PhD research, completed in 2018, focuses on human skeletal analysis and through osteological methods, investigates how uh, ancient humans adapted and evolved in northeastern and the northeastern Europe coastline. His research methods includes reconstruction of diet, disease, physical activity, uh, body shape, uh, body shape and size, based on various bone and tooth variants. He's now focused on studying the prehistoric peoples living uh, in coastal environments across Asia and new theoretical solution uh, more broadly. His other research interests includes coastal ethnography, human variation uh, and race, uh, public engagement in science and uh, uh, science communication, and decolonial approaches to archaeology and anthropology. So without further ado, Dr. Michael Rivera. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Um, and from uh, Hong Kong, where I call home. Um, I will mainly today speak about. Today I'll speak about. <laughs> I'll speak about gaming. <laughs> And what you what now? <laughs> so um, today I'll speak about my research, and I'll speak about stuff that I do in science communication and public engagement, and also teaching. I usually think of my work as split up into these three main areas. I'm super passionate about all three of them, so I'm very excited uh, to share this with you today. Just to introduce myself, um, I'm a Filipino guy. My dad is a Filipino guy. My mom is a Chinese Hong Konger. I grew up there uh, until I was 18. Um, they didn't have a lot of this field where I grew up. So I went to the UK and I went to collect degrees. Um, and after collecting a bunch of degrees, this is me uh, taking a selfie, you know, just before I was graduating. Very nervous that day. But um, Successfully, I became an expert in bioarchaeology, the study of ancient human remains, and biological anthropology. So very interested in human evolutionary trends, um, just looking at human variation, looking at human history. Um, throughout my PhD and MPhil, I was very passionate about sharing this with as many audiences as I could as well. So I have a lot of experience doing podcasting, uh, showing up on TV shows and BBC Radio. Uh, I came back here to Hong Kong. I started giving talks in schools as well, just like I did back in Cambridge. So I'll talk about that as well. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about, you know, my positionality and my biases. You know, uh, I think it's very important. One thing is that I have no illusion that I'm a very objective guy. All science is politically motivated. There are things that inform me 
like my privileges, my life experiences. And at the end of the day, I went to Cambridge, which is the heart of empire, um, the heart of the British empire. And even though my supervisor was a very nice guy, um, I'm, I learned a lot when I was there. I was exposed to the perspectives that were limited. And so I don't presume to be someone who is an expert in Asian archaeology or what it's like to live here and study this field. And so after I finished my PhD, I spent a lot of work, uh, I spent a lot of effort trying to unlearn a lot of things that I learned in Cambridge. And one of those things is to really understand how the history of archaeology and anthropology um, can really uh, split us up into bubbles between global north and global south, the west and the east. Um, how do we actually, like what is my role here as someone who grew up in Asia, went over there to train and then came back here? Um, and I think about that quite a lot. And I just wanna be upfront about who I am and where I come from. Um, the other thing about it is that I think a lot of the time um, I was trained by a lot of scientists who aren't really aware of how much they are inaccessible in what they say. So I find it quite important to speak like a normal person and speak excessively about um, the science that we do. There's no relevance to what we do to society unless we're able to communicate that with people. So you'll find the way that I talk is a little bit more informal and a little bit casual, but uh, I do treat my work very seriously. Um, I just wanna be upfront about that as well. Um, so my key research areas, I'm very interested in asking questions like, how has the human lineage evolved over the 6 million years, right? Of human evolution. Um, I especially love looking at the last 10 or 15,000 years or so, uh, how we evolved in the Holocene period in particular. And what are all the different influences um, that factor into how our skeletons are shaped? Um, and so you'll see in my PhD research that I focused on looking at skeletal collections, trying to find these very broad trends in how we eat, whether we're healthy or not, and what are we doing physically in our day-to-day -day life. Um, this kind of journey for me started when I was doing a master's research in particular. Um, one question I remember my one of my aunties asking me many years ago at lunch, she asked me, you know, why is it that we all come in different shapes and sizes? And that was really what inspired me. I asked my supervisor, can I look into this problem? And my supervisor um, at the time had a large data set of skeletal data from around the world. I went to different museums and added a few more uh, data points. And we were looking at uh, the long bones and how they're shaped and how large or small they were and seeing whether there were any broad trends that we could see, how did they vary around the world? Um, and what I found was that um, when you look at, for example, how um, temperature trends with the size of our limb bones, you actually see this uh, correlation where if you live in very warm temperatures, you're going to have longer proportions. So that expands your surface area. You can dissipate more heat. But if you live in a cold area, then you're going to have shorter limb proportions that helps you retain heat. Um, I also found something quite interesting, which is uh, these proportions can vary with seasonality, how much the temperature changes between summer and winter. So if you have a more fluctuating um, fluctuating temperature, fluctuating climate conditions, then also your bones will respond in a way, it's evolved in a way that allows you to, um, different populations to have been adapted to that kind of fluctuation. Um, when I went up to my PhD, I started to think about a specific location that I love the most, which is the coast. Um, I grew up in Hong Kong and uh, I always loved going to the beach. Um, I started to think about uh, trying to form a project around how people adapted to the Baltic coast. The Baltic region is in northeastern Europe. So the beaches, they're actually quite cold and they're very different from the ones in Hong Kong. Um, the temperatures will be something like zero degrees Celsius to 10 degrees Celsius on a summer day. So um, I was very curious anyway, uh, because they had a good skeletal collection to study. And I would look at factors like bone shape uh, through methods like 3D scanning them. Um, and I'll speak a bit about, uh, I'll speak a 
a bit more about that in a second. So to understand this region, I, I looked into the archaeological literature. Not a lot had been said about the bones, but there was a lot about the environmental archaeology and about the animal bones that they would find. In the earliest period, around the Mesolithic period, um, you have a lot of fishing behaviors, very similar to Southeast Asia. Um, you find tools that would have been useful for, you know, net fishing or for um, hook fishing. And you actually find in their shell middens, like a lot of fish bones, a lot of seashells um, that were left there behind in different sites. Uh, when we move into the Neolithic, they're still relying on quite sophisticated fishing tools. Um, and they're also hunting animals like seal. They start to develop some pottery to hold their, hold their food. They're actually used to store proteins in the first instance. Um, and you actually find uh, harvesting of amber on the coast. So a lot of amber accumulates um, and they were forming little uh, ornaments using that stone. It's only until around, uh, let's say 1500 um, BCE, that we have what we call the Bronze Age in that Northeastern context, Northeastern European context, where they start to experiment with using metal tools for farming and um, stone tools, hammer stones used for grinding grain. And in the Iron Age, they really expand this technology. They are also um, increasing in their population size and starting to demarcate their land with a lot of um, stone walls. So, um, what's very distinctive about this region is that this happens a lot later, this transition into farming than the rest of Europe. And I remember once going to a conference about European prehistory. I looked, uh, there was this map that the organizers put at the start of the program, and they mapped where all of us were studying. And you could see this line from Turkey to Greece to around like um, the Central Europe to Germany, France, UK, and it was just one straight line. But the coast in Portugal, Spain, and Italy, in the Baltic region where I study, just me, <laughs> just the one dot. And so it really started to show like that we, we know very little about how bones adapt in these areas. Um, and so I set out to answer this question. Um, luckily, there were these um, individuals I could study for my PhD in Estonia and Latvia, and I took measurements, I took 3D scans, I tried to observe um, signs of pathology, and I wanna share with you some of the trends that I found. So when we look at the, uh, when we look at the different bone proportions, um, this is for the upper arm, the humerus, this is for the lower arm, the ulna, this is for the um, upper leg, the thigh bone, the femur, and also the shin bone, the tibia. And what you actually see very broadly speaking is that um, you do see limb bone size increase. Um, but this is uh, important for studying is maybe we can see that, is it that people are healthier? Is it that people are moving into the population and those people are taller, so they put their genes into the population? Um, what are the different explanations for here? And I checked the genetic literature. So genetics work has been done here. And there wasn't a lot of population um, replacement. And so we can it, can, it points to the sign that maybe it was because of improvements in the diet generally. So transitioning into farming, uh, perhaps a more stable diet allowed people to grow taller. Um, whereas before they were undergoing stress um, and so they weren't growing as tall. I was interested in what we're doing um, physically. So when we look at activity, method is to laser scan um, the bones and then you can actually cross section the bones right in the middle here. Um, so maybe if you're looking at the leg bone, for example, you would cut at 50% and take a look at what that cross section looks like. Um, because the general size of that bone will point to how much physical activity they're taking on. So you can kind of see the shapes here as we go through the ages, it decreases in size. So as people are doing this um, transition into farming, maybe there are more tools to take over the upper arm. And so they're not exerting so much force anymore with their own arms. Um, and so this is decreasing. When we look at the leg bones, um, the more, more strange kind of trend, but it kind of goes up 
So maybe farm work and setting out these um, stone demarcations around their settlements uh, really work their legs a lot more. So we have a different story between the upper arm, sorry, with the between the upper limb and the lower limb. Um, and so through physical activity studies, we can actually track this through 10,000 years of evolution. Um, another thing that I wanted to look at is whether they're healthy or not. And we see, for example, that they have these uh, signs of porousness around the skull over here and in the upper region of their eye orbits. Um, we know that this is usually a sign of some sort of iron deficiency in their diet, but how that comes about is, is um, debatable. So um, it could be that it's because they had iron deficient diets, but it's unlikely because they're relying on a lot of fish and a lot of protein and iron that way. Um, they don't, uh, and when it comes to genetic predisposition, um, I looked at specifically how the, the porousness, how the lesions were appearing. It didn't seem indicative of a genetic predisposition. And so I checked out the literature some more and maybe another uh, factor could have been, even though they're taking in the iron, they could have had a lot of parasitic load from the environment around them. So seaside environments are famous for having a lot of um, different bacteria and viruses that are different from inland populations. And so maybe this environment introduced a lot of parasites into their body. Though they're eating the iron rich food, parasites are depleting them of the iron. And so this could explain um, a little bit about these lesions. Um, one last set of results I want to share is maybe how this transition from fish, fishing uh, diets into farming diets affected their teeth. And what we see is that when we look at dental cavities, when we look at gum disease, when we look at um, you know, the loss of teeth before death, so early loss of teeth, um, there seems to be this upward trend when you compare Mesolithic, Neolithic to the later Bronze Age and Iron Age. So something about the diet and eating more starchy grains was um, causing them to have more dental decay and more bacterial action over here in the mouth. Um, so what does that all mean? Very broadly speaking, um, what I found through my study is that, you know, coastal environments are really important to study. And as old as the age of Darwin, there was this bias against studying coastal and island populations. You know, Darwin, when he went on his missions on the Beagle, he would encounter these indigenous peoples and say, oh, look at them, they're eating mussels and oysters. How uncivilized and how, uh, how barbaric and unbecoming is, is nothing as sophisticated as Victorian London. And so what this did to the scientific community is really devalue how important coastal societies are in the overall narrative of human evolution. I think that these early ideas um, have contributed to this gap. Um, and so it's only in the last 30, 40 years, people really tried to fix this and do more long-term bioarchaeology studies in these areas. Um, and there's also relevance here because we can actually, um, for example, look at how coastal populations adapt to past environments. Maybe that can tell us about our own capacity for um, adapting to modern climate change. Um, but yeah, I always think of, of a lot about these anthropological biases and I'm curious in the discussion later whether you've found the same in your own research in lithics or bones or um, other environmental studies, whether you see the same phenomenon. Um, I'm gonna share now another area of my work, moving swiftly on, uh, about my work in public engagement as well. So in the last 12 years, I've worked very hard to try and also share what we do with as many audiences as possible, uh, very young audiences, very broad audiences from undergraduate students uh, to um, maybe those who are in secondary school, uh, been on the radio, been on the news in Hong Kong as well. And of course, I'm not the only one doing this kind of work. So I really admire and try and learn from those like Stephen Akabato at UCLA, who does a lot of work with the Ifugao and um, trying to promote indigenous voices in community archeology. span I really admire Maddie Go. I'm sure you all may have heard of Matthew and Maddie is, um, amazing and it's done amazing work in forensic anthropology trying to promote um, Filipino bioanthropology and forensics 
um, putting together the collections at different uh, different parts of the Philippines, but afterwards also appearing on podcasts and TV shows and documentaries, just doing the good work to share what we do in our field. Um, Christina, uh, Christina Chan, Winston Lee, they're my colleagues in Hong Kong. Sanghee Lee is a Korean American anthropologist. Tina Lassisi, all of these people make YouTube videos. They write books. Win Winsome in Hong Kong, my good, good friend, has written seven books in Chinese and English, which is really amazing, all about our field. Tina records TikToks. Um, you should go follow her on Instagram and TikTok. Um, she talks about genetics. Um, and so I really admire all this work. Um, I want to share with you a project that I did last year, which is about um, digging up something that is more historical archaeology. Um, if you don't know the history, in the 1940s, World War II came to Hong Kong and the Japanese were trying to take over and invade us. They, they actually had a hold of us for several years. Um, the British, the Canadian, the Indian, Pakistani, Bengali, the Australian, um, and also the American forces tried to fight them, um, especially the Air Force, the Navy. The US Navy had some airship carriers in the Pacific and they sent these um, bomber planes over to Hong Kong to try and help us. There was this one uh, night when they were trying to fight the Japanese on the 16th of January, 1945, and they sent a bunch of planes to Hong Kong. There were these two American US Navy planes that were on their way out. And just as they were trying to get out there, unfortunately, one of them hit the other one and both of them crashed down in the hills of Hong Kong. 70 years later, 75 years or so later, um, they were discovered. Like the remains of one of the planes were discovered in the jungle. And um, I, was, I was called by these, these hikers and, and adventurers in Hong Kong to go and investigate. These are the pictures I took on that day when I first saw the plane. And you see part of the engine over here, um, this really long piece. Uh, part of the landing gear underneath the airplane. This is a big metal plate that would have protected the pilot um, from bullet fire during that time. So these remains were just lying on the hills of Hong Kong over here. Um, just on this hillside, if you start uh, at the bus stop over here, you're probably walking about an hour and a half and hiking up 350 meters just to get to the site. Um, this was a really exciting opportunity because me and Winsome are like the only two, uh, at the time, only two in Hong Kong who knew how to do a full archeological excavation. So although we had a lot of volunteers, um, you know, she and I had to really run this stuff. We actually had 250 volunteers join us during those two weeks of excavation. And this was a really good opportunity for community archeology. span Winsome and I would start off with a briefing every morning um, I would give them their booklet and their clipboard, and I taught them how to, it was really cool, but like in a few hours or so, they actually mastered how to make these grid squares and take pretty good photographs of the context. They were helping me record the, the texture of the soil, the consistency, um, taking measurements before disturbing the land. Um, the one in red over here is my mother. She came up with me one day very special experience. Um, we had kids as young as like 10 years old, six years old. Um, we had volunteers who were like 87. They were retired, but they always had an interest in archaeology, just never had the chance. So this was a really, really special project for us. Um, they would even help us sketch some of the site map. And, you know, it's, it's good enough for me. It's really useful for me. My eyes can't be on everything um, across the whole entire site. So they helped me take measurements and draw these diagrams. Um, I actually taught them also how to uh, do some 3D scanning. So that really long piece, that's two meters long. Uh, let's see if this will work. This is two meters long, and it's a piece of the landing gear that is underneath the plane. So when the plane is about to land, this would, this would pop out and allow the wheel to come out so that it could land. So this is two meters long, it's really heavy. We're not gonna take it off the mountain. Um, we actually tried to do a lot of 3D scanning and imaging as well using photometry. Um, it is really exciting as well to kind of um, teach secondary school students, primary school students how to do that. 
secondary school uh, school students who are interested in STEM subjects, uh, want to enter engineering or physics, like this is kind of a little bit relevant to them. Um, some of the most important finds uh, came about in this excavation. Um, one of them was this one. So this is a place on the outside of the airplane. It actually has this really distinctive, um, distinctive curve. You know, a lot of planes have crashed across the Pacific. How do we prove that it's the plane that crashed that day? Um, we found the original manual. We found some um, images from the original manual in 1945 when they were constructing the plane. And we, because of the very distinctive shape, we were able to prove that it was that plane. So at the moment, Winsome and I are finalizing the report, which will go in the Journal of Conflict Archaeology. But we also want to write another paper coming up soon about the community aspect and how we shared the whole journey of that stuff. Um, we couldn't do it on our own, just the two of us, but with them, we could do it all. Um, they even helped us kind of bag them, document them. Um, this one here, this, <laughs> this young man is my boyfriend. <laughs> so I just bring all my loved ones up to the mountain. Um, I also appeared on the news, went on some programs. Uh, we have went to some schools to share the results during the excavation. Really exciting day when we uh, live streamed to a school, like the process of excavation. So um, maybe you guys have uh, maybe heard of the research done in South Africa, finding Homo Naledi in those caves and Rising Star. Um, that team also does a lot of this. So I was quite inspired by that. And I really wanted to show as many people as I could during the field work what we do. I'll move on just for the last uh, few minutes to talk about what I do in teaching. So when we return back to teaching undergraduates, um, I offer Hong Kong's first ever course on biological anthropology. And um, you can see that in the first few weeks, we talk about what is anthropology, the study of primates. Um, we go through the whole human evolutionary story. I teach them about science communication. We do three weeks of bone labs and forensics. And then we talk about um, human variation, uh, the history of race concepts, and why do we think about human diversity in different ways? Um, and what is the future of this field here in Hong Kong and in Asia? Um, just to share with you a bit, you know, for the very first time ever, ever in Hong Kong, there were kids who were 120 of them were looking at hominin skulls for the first time. They were learning to identify pathologies and actually draw them on their iPads. Um, this was a very special experience. They actually went into the bone lab. Um, we had an anatomical collection that we could use for teaching um, at the Faculty of Dentistry at my university. And they were sharing, they, they, they actually had to study that for about two weeks only. <laughs> By the third week, um, they were looking for an assignment. They had to have a mystery skull and then tell me everything they could about it, estimate their age, look for signs of diet, basically do my job. Um, at first they were all like scared because they never went into a bone lab before. They were all maybe not science majors. They were very nervous about it. But once they got to this assignment stage, they just walked in and they were like, mm, I got this. And they just, they just handled it. They just put all the teeth back in. They could identify, you know, periodontal disease. It was amazing. <laughs> um, and uh, one last final component I wanted to share was um, their last assignment was to do some public engagement even further. And so they talked in front of schools. They recorded podcasts. They made a lot of social media posts. These are all posted on my Instagram. So, you know, they were really practicing what I love about doing my work. Um, and so I was really proud of them. This, this group in particular, we thought that they would speak to 20 students and um, the principal uh, 24 hours beforehand called and said, oh, we were super excited for you. I've canceled the classes for all the school. <laughs> so this group actually talked in front of 280 students. Um, they were so brave <laughs> and they handled it. I don't think I could do that. Um, and they did it in three languages also. They did it in English and Cantonese and Mandarin. Amazing. Um, so super, super proud of my 
cohort this year um, beyond my expectations. Um, at the end of my lectures, I like to give a summary. So let me just do that as well. Um, so after 17 years, there remains a lot of questions I wanna ask about my field in Hong Kong and in Asia, being involved with outreach um, grows very important uh, for me every year I do this. And I'm really lucky to have these amazing students this semester and it excites me that some of them might end up becoming the next anthropologist who joined me, the only ones in Hong Kong. So it's not just me and Winsome. Um, and so it'd be very exciting to think about ways we could collaborate um, between Philippines and Hong Kong in research and also teaching and also outreach. So thank you so much for listening to me today. Thank you, Michael, for that really interesting presentation. Uh, I really like how, <laughs> I really like, um, you know, the, the, the broad range of topics that you not only cover, but that, you know, you actually take the time to reach out to the broader community. I know that that's um, an aspect of archaeology that uh, we here in the Philippines are also trying to build upon. So I'm glad that uh, we, we're we aligned on that aspect. And of course, I'm sure that many of us here would like to partner with you in the future, especially those in bioarchaeology, human osteology. I'm sure they would love to talk with you uh, at some point. Um, so how this is going to work, um, usually after the talk, there's a Q&A session. Um, just for uh, technical purposes, I'm going to give a little bit of a uh, premium to those questions coming in the chat, if there are any, for the first 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, just so it's easier on our end to post the recording afterwards. So feel free to ask your questions now. But if I interrupt you, it's because there's a question in the chat. So go ahead. Does anyone have any questions? Did you find any new entertainment systems? Very shortly after the World War, the US had sent a lot of people to go out and find the human remains. Winsome is a forensic anthropologist. And obviously, I work with bones too. So, just in case there were any fragments, at least we knew what to do. Um, but in the end, um, we think that they all three bodies were returned shortly after the war. Yeah. I apologize if you very close. If your research, um, so that pattern that you're seeing is something that was throughout the Afghan war with the increase of the I think that I think that when it comes to dental paleopathology, we do see that trend in most transitional populations as, and after the transition more disease. Um, something that's quite different would be maybe like which kind of conditions or which diseases we can observe. Um, so, for example, uh, what's different about the coastal environment when you eat a lot of fish is that you would develop more calculus because the protein environment, like the protein that you're taking in, makes it more alkaline in your mouth, and then more um, more calculus deposits form. Um, and what that actually does is protect a little bit more your teeth from developing caries. So, compared to more inland drier environments, um, we would see an even higher rate of caries. Um, we see the trends, but in absolute terms, like in, abs in absolute values, they're lower than you find in inland populations because strangely calculus is protecting, protecting their teeth from that bacterial action. Uh, not yet, given I've given conference talks, but working on the papers, yeah, yeah. Okay, I have a question here in the chat. Uh, are there, uh, okay, so question here. Are there any skeletal remains that can be, uh, yeah, are there any skeletal remains that can be studied from Hong Kong? The, our Hong Kong history uh, stretches back about 7,000 years. That's the oldest that we have. Nothing as impressive as here. <laughs> but, um, uh, uh, and so, I know that they've been excavated uh, as early as the 20s, the 60s, 80s. There are excavations of these different island sites. Um, they're stored by some government offices. And I am asking them maybe like once every two or three months, can I please look at them? Like, you don't study them, but I, 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 can, I know what to do with them. So um, they, they, don't really, uh, they don't really say yes just yet. 
but I think they just don't know me. What I hoped with the airplane project was that, look, look, look what I can, I can, I can do studies and I can share with the public, look how good it is. Hopefully that will do something to convince them that, you know, I can look at the bones as well. But there are there are human remains and they go back they go back as far as seven thousand when we have our early Neolithic age. Okay, and I have another couple questions here in the chat. This one is from Paolo Vasilia. Says, Hi Mike, thank you for your fascinating presentation. Uh, as a part of your public outreach, how do you reach out to primary and or secondary school teachers? And I, I went on Google Maps, I searched secondary school and <laughs> I called everyone and I emailed everyone. <laughs> and actually, uh, surprise, maybe it won't surprise anyone, but um, secondary school teachers love it when you take over an hour and they don't have to do anything. <laughs> and um, what's really cool about my about our whole field is also you can do it for biology class, history class, language class, um, pretty much chemistry, physics, math, economics, geography, like all the teachers are very keen to like fit anthro and archaeo into any lesson, any curriculum that they have. So um, maybe that's something you can try to. I actually think that a lot of teachers are very keen on that collaboration. Uh, if I could just sort of add on to that question. Um, yeah. Uh, because actually, some of us here, uh, part of PAPI and also Archaeosoft students, actually did just that throughout the pandemic. I think it was 2020 or 2021, mm -hmm. where we did a virtual conference for uh, educators primarily. Cool. So eight to twelve features mm -hmm. and did exactly that. So I'm, I'm uh as the next person who's gonna be in charge of that project, I'd love to share those with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh different aspects of how to do just that. Sounds good. Yeah, yeah. And next question by Seth Tala uh here in the chat. Hello Dr. Uh, in your experience, what are ethical uh, ethical and institutional processes involved when acquiring when acquiring scalpel samples uh, for both collections? and uh, other challenges as well. I always think that it's very important that before you go uh, asking for access to the collection, um, maybe it's a good idea to ask the curators or the local researchers at the museum or at the university, you know, is there anything like with my skill set, like here's my CP or here's what I've done before in my research, you know, is there anything here that could help you out? And in my experience, I've gone to museums where um, they actually needed help with inventory. Like their, their database was a mess. So while I'm there doing research, I can spend half my day helping them like log which bones are, are there for which skeleton, um, just trying to get the paperwork done and I can spend the afternoon doing my data collection. So it's always like a trade-off. Um, and there's so many different things you can do. You can, you can offer to give like skills workshops to their students. You can also offer to, of course, co-author papers in the future, um, get those get those in writing and promise, uh, you know, in a contract that any publications will be done collaboratively. They help with the context. I interpret the bones. Um, let's go to conferences together. Let's apply for funding together. Um, the, those are the challenges there. Um, in Hong Kong also, I think one ethical thing that is it a challenge? It's certainly a question where there's no rules about the treatment of human remains, um, unlike, like, let's say, in the US or Australia or the UK, about the treatment of human remains. So I have a very strong feeling that, you know, as I increase, as me and Winston do more outreach work and broaden this field in, in my city, um, and there's more interest in this field, Winston and I are probably going to have to, like, approach the government and actually try and write this into law somehow about, let's say that we find a skeleton out in a police forensic case, or somehow a collector has donated their private collection of bones to the museum. How do we handle that? Because at the moment we have no guidelines and we're kind of borrowing those from, from other nations. So I think we have to write up those ethical procedures. Thank you. Great. Uh, well, I guess people in the virtual audience ruminate uh, on more thoughts and questions. Does anyone live? Hello. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. I think, um, you know, when I was growing up, I had nothing. Like I had no exposure to any of this field. Um, and the only reason that I entered this field was because when I was 13, I watched a TV show called Bones, mm -hmm. and uh, which is on Fox. And, you know, if Kathy Reichs didn't um, write those books and Fox didn't make that TV show, I would never have been who I am, found the field that I love. Um, and so I kind of want to give that experience to others. And um, that project was, was so important in different ways because I could, uh, for example, help a lot of people. I think, you know, what we're looking at is basically like a grave site. It's where people had perished. And so I think that in society, you know, we all face death, we all contemplate death, but they don't have an outlet. And I was the person for these 250 volunteers to face that at, you know, in that time, um, in a safe space. Like I was their person that they could feel safe to explore that with. Um, another aspect is of course that, that was a, that was a, a story of American history, Japanese history, Chinese history, British history. Um, in this day and age, politics is very contentious. A lot of things divide us, but um, I had students from all around the world and they were they were there with me. In a way, like it was very important because tr trust me, like in Hong Kong, it's not easy to talk about politics, but I could do that in a way because I could talk about stuff in the past and use that as a way to bring people together in the current and kind of talk about how like maybe uh, conflict in the past wasn't very good. What can we learn from that history? So yeah, it was very, it was also a very strange experience as a Filipino guy, like studying a US Navy plane, you know? So in many, many different aspects, it was um, something that I had to think through and do my best to like communicate with them about. Yeah, uh, great yeah. question. Yeah, thank you, Hermi. Uh, just for clarification for the online audience, the question was around public archeology span and why it's uh, such an important piece for Michael's work. Mm. Right, does anyone else have a question? Oh my gosh. No, okay. Well, I guess I have a question. Um, yeah, as someone uh, who belongs to the Filipino diaspora, uh, do you have any, I guess, like what, what's your, in, what's your outlook? I guess that's the right word, uh, in terms of, you know, connecting, you know, your work uh, to the diaspora, because I know for myself, that's something that's of great interest to me. I've been talking with yeah. Hermine on, on doing work for that. Uh, and I guess what's your outlook, perspective, your approach to that, if there is any, or is this still, still something that you're sort of thinking about? Definitely still thinking about it. But uh, what I would say is that in you know, in Cambridge, the professors of Asian prehistory, Asian bioarchaeology, Asian whatever, whatever, they're always like someone who was brought up in a Western European or American context or Australian. And um, I think that, you know, very tragically, they don't appreciate enough the work that's been done by prehistorians or archaeologists here, especially those who've been working here for 20 or 30 years. So I find that because I have access to those spaces, um, it is my responsibility to tell them, look at this paper by people who work here, pay attention because it's really valuable to the study of human history. Um, and I, uh, my university is, is also a very, uh, another thing is just materially, what can I do? Literally just money <laughs> or equipment, right? Or paying people to do stuff. And so when I'm brainstorming, it's like at my university in Hong Kong, it's a very rich university. <laughs> they fund a lot of engineering and architecture and medicine stuff. Um, I would like to apply for funds too and just spend them all in Southeast Asia. Like uh, two weeks ago, I went to Indonesia as well and I talked to them about collaboration there. Um, that's the best I can do, but I'm never gonna presume that I come here, I know more than anybody. All I can do is say that um, this is what I can do for your outreach. This is what I can do for like skills that I know. But, you know, I'm sure that all of you have your own approaches that work extremely well. And there's nothing more I can do except, you know, leave you to your work, respect it, and tell other people to pay attention to here. That's how I see it. Don't know if you agree. <laughs> no, yeah, I definitely agree with that. And, uh, 
one of the, I guess, the biggest challenges for me right now is sort of connecting and like, especially from my background, uh, you know, the severe lack, but I know of the interest people, it's just raising awareness when you said. So I think that that's a really good, uh, really good approach just to the, I guess, signals the best. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions? Either in the online virtual chat or public? Are you ready to send a survey that, Mike? That is the plan, sir. And, <laughs> and Mike is right. I think your attitude is, you know, is uh, help. it's not a question of othering or being different. It's a question of expressing what you want, what you know. Sense. Okay, and I think we have another question and comment here in the chat by Ara Mariano. Uh, he says, hello, Dr. Mike. Thank you for your insightful presentation. I really hope to meet you in person at ASU, uh, School of Archaeology, after uh, while you are in the Philippines. How relevant is forensic archaeology for Hong Kong? Is it act actively used by judici judicial institutions? And are there any challenges for you and your partner in facing forensic archaeology? Um, there are forensic cases in Hong Kong that happen, um, and sometimes the police will um, they mostly call Winsome. Winsome is the one who's been working in forensics for a longer time. And are there any challenges? The challenge is that she's the only one. So um, what we're trying to do is actually uh, build up more programs and build up more research capacity in Hong Kong. And hopefully it can expand. Um, I really, really, really admire the work that, um, you know, Matthew Go and, and others have done in the Philippines. Um, and I think that there's something that's cool. I think that's something that's quite common across this part of the world. Because I know that in Thailand and Japan, in Singapore, Vietnam, you know, all of us are thinking about how to increase that capacity for this field. Um, so it's just something that we're also doing in Hong Kong. How relevant it is, it's relevant as much as Winsome and I can do, basically, and how much we can um, spread the word about why this field is, is cool and why it's important for society. Okay. Okay. Yeah, just for clarification for the Zoom call, uh, Ma'am Grace asked a question uh, about uh, official co collaborations between the School of Archaeology and uh, the University of Hong Kong. Okay. There were these ideas that I had, there were three main ideas that I talked to my co the, our colleagues in Indonesia about. Um, the first one is, in the first instance, we can definitely trade workshops, like, or lectures. Um, so, you know, my, my students can listen to some of you talk, and your students can listen to some of, you know, me and Winsome and others who work in Hong Kong about, you know, how does archaeology and anthropology work in our different contexts. We can trade that off pretty quickly, I think. Maybe the second part could be to think about ways to uh, research together. So if we have prehistoric bones in Hong Kong, is there anything we can compare with prehistoric bones of the same period or in the same kind of environment, eating the same kind of diet or have the same kind of lifestyles with the bone uh, parameters look the same? And if they're different or the same, why would that be? Um, in the long, long term, what would be really cool uh, I spoke to our colleagues in Sulawesi, like, oh, if we could bring some, you know, Indonesian students to Hong Kong and my Hong Kong students to Indonesia in some sort of exchange program, that could be like a longer term thing where we apply for funding from both universities and see what could be, what we can get and then see what can happen. Yeah? Yeah, I think mean, uh, Yes, meaning more folks. Um, hmm. So that's just wants to do a bigger project like that for the funding. That would be awesome. Yeah. Michael, what about your one place? And you're just on the other side of the way you receive South China Sea. And we're on the other side. 
But you know, yeah. where where are the other side? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you went to you went to Sarah to Lake City. Not yet, but want to. Lake Granny, you say that. But my point is, uh, done a lot of work with coastal landscapes. Yeah, and there's a lot of discourse or black in the sea. That very very important things, mm -hmm. and there are those sites that are ready to copy. Yeah, now, long long, uh, uh, set out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting. I think to pursue further. Yeah, I think to international respect. To kind of like go all along and yeah. fill the gaps. Yeah. And what I find actually in different countries, like what I learned in Indonesia and uh, just going through the National Museum here also. And in Hong Kong, like a lot of archaeology, archaeology reports already exist, but they were published a long time ago. Yes. And so it's kind of like, can anyone go all around them? In our collection. <laughs> Translate all the different languages and like, yeah. But they're not they're not published in big international journals. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned, what you did in Bulawayo, mm -hmm. coastal, very specific, coastal uh, human and coastal landscape interaction. Mm -hmm. I don't think that has really been uh, explored in the hill mm -hmm. or that has been. Yeah. Uh, it's always been referred to, used, uh, many, 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 uh, take pictures, but mm -hmm. uh, that really uh, systematically, systematically yeah. yeah. Thank yeah. you. It's a good idea. And I actually find like <laughs> an aspect of when I finished my PhD, like um, you know, like I grew up because it's uh, my feeling was like oh, I grew I, when you when I grew up in this field is when I realized that um another thing about afterwards when you become a, an expert is like the feeling of um you're part of a network and how much you engage that network of your peers is up to you. Uh, I think all of those who finish PhDs go and stay in their own lab, in their own postdoc, and they don't talk to anyone else. But um, yeah, for a researcher, like collaboration is quite important. Yeah. That's what I'm doing now. Trying, trying. It is pretty fun. <laughs> Thank you. Very good. So I do believe we're coming up on time, and I believe some of our profs actually have class. So I want to um, sort of round things up and end things here officially. But of course, for the students, uh, and you know, maybe afterwards, uh, uh, Michael is more than happy to have a chat. So again, thank you everyone for uh, coming today to the uh, official uh, first official final talk of the year. Um, and we'd like to again, once again, thank Dr. Michael Rivera for his uh, talk today. Uh, so next week, um, the next edition, again, is to having a safe time, same room, uh, by Dr. Ian Caldwell. Um, Lord is going to be talking about Sulawesi uh, and historical archaeology. Although, for those of you tuning in online, it's going to be only in person. So be here tomorrow, again, uh, on my screen. Next week, yeah. <laughs> Thank you.